Hello, and welcome to the 49th Radical Poetry Reading. I'm Malvika Jolly, Special Projects Associate here at The Rail, and today we welcome you to a poetry reading in celebration of the life and legacy of poet Diane de Prima, uh, who left us just last year, and here we all are meeting in her wake, uh, as I'm sure I will be and we will be for quite some time. Uh, today I have the pleasure of welcoming our dear friend, poet and literary chronicler of our times, Neely Cherkovsky, who has lovingly curated a wonderful lineup of poets and readers today featuring Amil Alcalé, Robert Kelly, Sarah Larson, Aaron Shurin, Cedar Saigo, David Levi Strauss, and Anne Waldman. We've started out all of our events here with two important acknowledgments. The first is that here in New York we're on Lenapahoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. And it's worth saying that the heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all those who struggle for freedom. In that spirit, I'll share in just a moment a living document of resources and actions we've been putting together behind the scenes at the rail. Uh, and now it's my honor to welcome our wonderful host of this afternoon. Neely Cherkovsky is a poet, memoirist, literary chronicler, and editor, but most importantly, he is one of the tor torch bearers of deep cultural generosity, uh, which we find is so increasingly vital in the world of arts and letters. Uh, in our last event with him, he mentioned that Ferlin Getty knew how to be friends, and I think that speaks to Neely and his practice as well. His latest books of poetry are Hang on the Yahtzee River, an elegy for my beat generation. He's the biographer of Charles Bukowski and Lawrence Ferlinghetti and the recipient of an American Book Award and the Josephine Miles Penn Award. Uh, without further ado, Neely, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> so I, I want to mention that two days ago, Jack Hirschman most of you know, died at, uh, at the age of 87. And uh, we've been dealing with that here. It just was a 54-year friendship. I think he's up at, at, at a Cafe Trieste in the clouds with David Meltzer, Diane De Prima, and, and other poets like that. That's what I like to think. So I wrote some remarks on uh, Diane. Not so long ago, I leafed through my copy of Selected Poems, 1958 to 1976 by Diane de Prima. Two decades of writing containing a good number of the poems on which her reputation would come to rest. <clears throat> I knew a few of them by heart and I often went to others to find balance and to fill the empty hours. The other day it dawned on me just how long ago 1976 is here in 2021. This gathering of poems is 370 pages in length and Diane was just getting started. She had a flotilla of songs to sing and many ways of doing that. I remember a reading at City Lights Books maybe 15 or 20 years ago. She sat in the front row writing in her notebook. As a scribbler myself, I identified when I first visited her in a long-term care facility at the corner of Mission and Silver, a few blocks from my home in Bernal Heights, a San Francisco neighborhood, Diane lay propped up in bed writing so distant from the selected poems. We know and appreciate this unconquerable soul as a teacher, as a friend, as a helping hand in moments of doubt and as a maker of books. She could be restless, stormy, meditative, forever aligned to the idea of a community of poets. At the end of the Tenth of Pisa, a Sestina for Ezra Pound, which he sent via email after a discussion we had on the poet, Diane writes, Oh, poets of sunrise, whose songs raise terrible questions like tangled vibes, your mind an edge suddenly aflames, or the wild eyes of lynxes. And this from Loba herself. Michael McClure writes of simple eyes when contemplating childhood. 
He meant for each sentence or phrase to stand on its own, for all of them to finally harmonize, symbolize. Oh, we are wise when we look at others through their eyes. Simplicity to the complex and the other way around. From Shire to Shire, Diane worked wheel and kiln, following young Endymion past the smoking ruins of druid magic. She dances down the valleys wild and tells us it is rumored that the unicorns have stacked, staked a large claim in the Rocky Mountains. Diane's rant from a cool place is not a rumor, but an impressive hall in the house of poetry. And so we gather to honor this bard, one of those whom we must listen to. I thank Fong and the Brooklyn Rail staff for the attention to poetry and to Diane de Prima. The writers gathered here represent the vitality of American consciousness in these difficult times. Diane de Prima Presente. So there you go. And uh, this is my poem for Diane. Yeah, I must say, I did do want to say she lived just a few blocks away and, and about two and a half years ago, Shepard Powell called me, her partner, and said, Diane would like you to come and visit. I didn't know she was in the facility. It was called the Jewish Home for the Aged, but they changed it to the Center for Creative Living, something like that. And it's, it is quite a wonderful place. And the idea that it's at the corner of Mission and Silver, really something. One afternoon, it's a beautiful planet. Is everybody sleeping? Stay well, old age is dying late at night in somber tones. Deer wander, a fox disappears. No, we don't need flowers here in the Alps, only her harmonium. Tell me, Diane, because I am thinking all the way over to your room in the care facility, I envision a photo from the 1950s, you perched on a piano, Swarthmore dropout. How you love John Keats, those great letters, his negative capability, your floating bear, your love for younger poets taken by revolutionary letters, your devotion for the return, exile's letter, and the ballad of the goodly fair, all from Ezra. You visited him in the madhouse, you and the ABCs of reading, you and 1950s America. Hello, Leroy. So much depends on what we seem and where we stand. Thank you for the clarity and concision larger than politics. You and Shepard here to read on an elegiac night. Diane gave birth to dancing stars. Down the road, wise silence, nurses ask, who is she? Visitors every hour, she keeps a schedule at bedside, books on either side of the bed. Buses sneeze on Mission Street, trees gossip on the fog. I smell medicine, an orderly with crooked teeth peeks in the room. Oh, look, Diane, the sun believes. Indeed, after an hour, we leave forever blessed, invisible light. What then? Tassajara, perhaps. Mount Tamalpais, for sure. Words floating on autumn evening as you watched your pen devour the aurora in a notebook. You knew poetry in a tangle of letters and moss pebbles and words, Neely, please hand me that bottle of water, you said, and said you wanted to go home. No matter, breath of an archaic strophe, reading your lips, caressing your wrist. Diane, I said, the snow is deep on our streets, reindeer butt against municipal barriers. You are expected at Naropa, Allen, 
Anne, you follow Waylon to a secret trail on Sourdough Ridge. Relentless dreamer, seeker, here you exist on the terrain covered by shadows of the wolf who traverses imagination. The room is a forest, your window deep river. I see old trees and sunlight. I hear animals stalking. Oh, look, Diane, the child is you. Smack in the heart of Buddha's brow. See you in a handheld mirror tomorrow morning. What about writing? You told us just before dusk, the sun's out. Look, we have shadows. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Neely. Um, I love that keeping a schedule from the hospital bed. Look, we have shadows. Um, it, it also occurred to us, we have our friends from City Lights here in the Zoom uh, right now. Uh, who in just about a month are publishing a never-before-seen memoir by Dan, part elegy, part memoir, um, and my understanding is an account of sort of New York in the 60s and her diarying practice. Um, so I'll drop a link to that, uh, as well as the re-release of Revolutionary Letters coming in October shortly. Uh, but thank you all so much. Um, next up is poet, translator, and critic, and scholar Amil Alkaleh. Uh, he's the author of From the Warring Factions, which came out with Beyond Baroque, 2002 a book-length poem dedicated to the Bosnian town of Srebrenica, poetry, politics, and translation, American isolation in the Middle East, a lecture given at Cornell and shared with all of us via print. He's a regular contributor to The Village Voice and his poetry, prose, reviews, and articles uh, have appeared in the New York Times book review, The New Yorker, and many more. Emil, take it away. And you should be able to unmute. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I will read a few passages from Spring and Autumn Annals, a masterpiece, but I wanted to start uh, with the recognition of Jack Hirschman. And I found this poem that uh, Diane had sent me uh, that she had written for Jack's 80th birthday. So I want to read that. Jack Hirschman, birthday poems, City Lights Bookstore, 2013. Jack Hirschman in Venice, California, 1962, behind canals one or two and crumbling facades. Jack's cottage tucked in behind oil pumps on the beach. Jack in a cottage tucked in looking out the window. Jack Hirschman at UCLA reading papers from students. Jack Hirschman holding forth against the Vietnam War. Jack Hirschman pontificating, radicalizing said students. Jack Hirschman and the students walking out of UCLA to go to a demonstration. Jack Hirschman walking out of UCLA without a job. Jack Hirschman in San Francisco scribbling everywhere, handing out pastels at poetry readings, everyone's poetry readings. Jack Hirschman putting pastel drawings on all the tables at the Keystone Corner. Every day at Vesuvio's holding forth, Jack getting shaggy and skinny, very skinny. Jack Hirschman getting too skinny. Jack Hirschman in La Trieste seeking Bob Kaufman. Jack Hirschman at La Trieste seeking Lenin. Jack Hirschman at La Trieste seeking God. Jack Hirschman reading his poems out loud to everyone. Jack reading everyone's poems out loud to anyone. Jack Hirschman teaching everyone how to write his poems. Jack Hirschman teaching everyone how to write their poems. Jack Hirschman teaching everyone everything they should know. Jack Hirschman in the Trieste reading the Zohar. Jack Hirschman and David Meltzer translating Kabbalah for David Meltzer's Tree Magazine. Jack and David translating Kabbalah together for three books, Jack Hirschman's Book of Enoch, Jack Hirschman and Eliezer of Worms, Jack and David translating bunches and bunches of Kabbalah all over town, Jack Hirschman, the polymath, denouncing erudition, Jack becoming a Marxist, turning his back on Kabbalah, Jack becoming a Stalinist, turning his back on Marxism, Jack <laughs> turning his back on Stalin and madder than ever, Jack turning his back, turning into a human pretzel, Jack Hirschman delighting in everything he ever turned his back on. Jack Hirschman up for days delighting in everything. Jack Hirschman tired, insisting he's never tired. Jack Hirschman playful and charming. Jack Hirschman a Pied Piper leading the revolution. Jack and Aggie fierce and delighted in Vesuvios. Jack and Aggie hanging tough together at Specs. Jack and Aggie playing and stormy together at home. Jack leaving many messages to call him. Jack insisting I call him right away, then turning his phone off. Jack Hirschman never answering his cell phone. 
Jack telling me to text him. My phone doesn't text. Jack demanding I text him. I don't know how. Jack, sure, I'll feel better if I just drink some vodka. Jack telling me, give up dentists and grow a mustache. It's cheaper. Jack Hirschman at 80, looking 12. Jack looking wise, either 12 or a very wise infant. Jack passionate and careful. Jack tender and cruel. Jack Hirschman making the world a better place, whether it likes it or not. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. And uh, this is uh, this beautiful, gorgeous masterpiece, Spring and Autumn Annals uh, by Diane. And hopefully it starts to make evident that Diane was a great, great before, but not without songs and rejoicing. I see the new people, they are hairier than the old in perpetual, goony, elaborate grins. They're skinnier than their ancestors. They're bigger and speak more slowly. They dance almost all the time. They play flutes, one note for days. The divas are visible to them. They converse with the kinis and comfort the hungry ghost. The dancing in side streets at midnight to the moon, the loading platforms used for impromptu stages and long harvest dances in the swing rendezvous to Dinah Washington's rhythm and blues on a jukebox. These things are now one, they are rights. The young can do all this without anger, without belligerence. The love that we brought forth, that we brought to birth in sadness and sorrow is lighting up the air. It will light up the air through the orange flash, through the infinite thunderbolt of the great war and wash us like gentle waves onto new shores. Our work is done. The young men wear their hair to their shoulders. The babies are dirty and caper in the streets. The young women dance. They are openly sexual. I shall take my place with the old ones of this tribe, rear the babies and tell stories, all the stories I can remember. Kirby and I shoring up mythologies. Our work is done. Some of us died, I know, in the doing of it, and some of us will die because it is done. Unable to take our place in the new order and the slowness and understatement of that air. Now that the high excitement and style of battle falls from our shoulders like gold and silver capes. Bravo. Last year, three days before your death, this is addressed to her friend, Fred Herco. Last year, three days before your death, did you under constraint and complaining the while help me to carry firewood home to the house, that which was for us epitome of house, while I explained to you how important the fire was and urged you on bitching, did you then desire to whisk Jeannie from her duties into a day of play? You both together instead took dance class. I insisting it was important that Jeannie take dance class. Now on the radio is La Boheme, belonging to an unspeakably ancient layer of myself. And I wonder a lot about the lost cities of Africa, how the mother fashioned them, and if they pleased her. I'm sure that Manahata pleased her a while. It was so willing to play, to sport in the incandescent glow of Maya. And then drooping like John Cage in the 60s, like an old fire just before dawn, like pumpkins caught in a frost. It lies now gray. The towers are melting. They're flattening out. They are almost not there at all. Where there were towers are now flat office buildings, melting like wax the spires of Manhattan in the heat of approaching events. The river turns black, it turns back on itself, it fills with salt. There is a fire waiting under the earth, under the earth's skin, so that we dance more lightly, leaping into the air. Harvey Brown in Buffalo makes books. I make books. John Wieners, Olson hiding in Gloucester, reads maybe the hymns to Kali John got for me. Eleven million Turks are voting today, the man on the radio just said to me. Truly, wonderful is the sport of Brahma. Thank you. Well, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Emil. Uh, thank you both for that tribute to Diane and also for Jack. Uh, next up to the stage, we invite American poet Robert Kelly, who has authored more than 60 volumes of fiction, poetry, and prose poems. Uh, significantly, his 67 debut novel, The Scorpions, opened up the doors to a cult readership that has never closed. And he has served in the time since as poet in residence at numerous universities. He was the 2016-2017 Poet Laureate of that wonderful terrain, Dutchess County, New York. Uh, give it up, everyone, for Robert Kelly. Yeah. Yeah. And... Hello. Um, perfect. 
Hello. I'm a bit afraid that I'm a little bit of an outsider here because, well, I knew Diane, I did not know her well. And when I knew her, it was a long time ago. And that long time ago is what I want to talk about quickly. <clears throat> if you know Brooklyn at all, you'll know that there's an A train that runs to the end of the world, but in those days it stopped at Euclid Avenue. There's another train we used to call the IRT that ran to a place called New Lots, which lived up to its name. Empty fields, empty fields, stretching to the marshes of Jamaica Bay. In between those two stops, which we can call East Brownsville and South Brownsville, the area is empty. So empty that one night I had to walk from one station to the other to get home. I found myself followed by a pack of 20 dogs walking through empty fields. I could have been in Poland. I could have been in the Veneto. I was in anywhere but Brooklyn where Diane comes from too. We were landslides. We came from the same neighborhood. I didn't know in the neighborhood, but I want to remind you of that neighborhood, a place that was powerfully Italian of the East and powerfully Jewish of the West. And that the in-between, the, the, the beauty of difference ran through America. You'd never think you were in New York there. There were marshes, there were boats, there were houses built on stilts in Jamaica Bay. The bus came to an end. There were safe houses tucked away in empty fields. And there was Diane, and there was me, and there were 10,000 people from Apulia and Sicily, and 10,000 people from Lubavitch, and there we all were. And that is the world from which she came. Now, we think of Diane <clears throat> as nowadays California, the, the wisdom goddess of San Francisco, the one whose salon served the purposes of so many young poets, so many, many young poets who were inspired, guided by her. But I think of this little girl who grew up in Little Italy, a little Italy that didn't even have churches and houses. A little Italy where on Fountain Avenue at five o'clock at night, you would see a herd of cows led up through the traffic past the cars into their barn, a barn, an old garage, and that had been reconverted from cars to cows. 1960, that was happening when Diane was what, 16, 15 years old? Uh, a strange time in her 20s, early 20s. That is the neighborhood from which she came, that's the neighborhood from which I came, and that allows me to feel about her something closer than I guess I should be permitted to feel. But what strikes me now is so important to say is very few of, I don't think any of you, maybe not even nearly, would remember just how masculine male-driven, male-exclusive, exclusive poetry was, advanced poetry, radical poetry was in the 1950s. John was born, I think, in 1934, a year before me. I think that's right. When we were in college, in school, the radical poetry began. And what did we have in New York? We had Ginsburg. We yeah, had a little off to the right, Michelin. Somewhere in the middle, we had Kaufman. Then we had those rich people, the Ashburys and the Kenneth Cokes. And we had, of course, there were women in the world. They were famous women like Marianne Moore, for example, but they weren't part of the battle. The battle was on the ground. The battle was on East 10th Street and 2nd Avenue, just as 3,000 miles away, the battle was in North Beach and Mission, where we had Duncan and Spicer and all their crew. You know who that is. That's where the battles were going on. North Beach, Mission, 10th Street, Second Avenue. And in between was this empty country. I remember someone saying, was it me? 
What America needs is for all of us beatniks to get the hell out of New York and San Francisco and populate the country. Bring beat poetry to Dakota, to Kansas, wherever it may have been. Into that world came the two, the miracle of the two Dianas. On the West Coast, out of Whittier, this unassuming, slight, bespectacled, rather severe young blonde named Diane Wachowski, who suddenly appeared in the middle of all those boys and out in our neighborhood in Brooklyn, suddenly into New York, seen comes from not quite as blonde, a bit redder than blonde, this strange Italian girl from Brooklyn, Diane Dupree. And these two Dianes suddenly made woman's presence possible. You cannot imagine how tiresome it was in those days not to have the woman's voice raised in the field of battle. They were raised elsewhere in the sedate academia of the world. But right there where we needed them, the coffee shops, the bars, the shouting matches, that's where they were needed. And they came, Diana Wachowski from the West, Diane de Prima from the East, and I celebrate their presence. Diane Wachowski is still living. I, I mourn Diane de Prima, as by the way, <clears throat> I mourn Jack Hirschman, whom I first met in 1951, seven years ago, when we were both students at City College, when he taught me something wonderful about poetry. He would come up to a, we, he and I were kind of the lights of poetry in those days, dim lights because the great light had been Jerome Russellberg, who had just graduated. And he was off in Germany with Diane, the other Diane, the third Diane. And there we were, somewhat illuminous, but not quite the way Russellberg was. So Hirschman ranted and I ranted and we wrote our poems. But what Jack would do then, and I think went on his through life nearly to confirm this or not, but he would come up to you and lean on your shoulder and bring his wonderful mouth two and a half inches away from your poor ear and speak a poem. Here's somebody else's. It's this, the self-importance, the conceit of the poet matched by the immense generosity of the giving. So he taught me, as he taught all of us, the importance of that self-importance. I have something to say, here it is. But also the immense generosity of giving it to him. As for years and years and years after, he stood on the streets in San Francisco giving the poem, paper, words, paper, words. Anyway, but though I mourn Jack too very much, but, uh, and thank you both for speaking about him so far. Back to Diane, the power of her presence in that scene, that boy, bad boy, uh, shouting match, that was poetry in 1958, 59 in New York City. The power of her pure intensity, the generosity and intensity of her presence. The fact that her work, and you can hear from the, the section that um, I just read that wonderful passage, that you can hear the intensity with which the things of this world mattered to her, but mattered to her as she could make them into song, make them into beauty. That generosity was so great. I've heard from so many young poets who met her out in San Francisco, how generous she was how she gave them, well, maybe some of Jack's Kabbalah still, maybe a little bit of, uh, of that, that world of, uh, that, that of Kabbalah means receiving, doesn't it? Kabbalah means what we are given. And she was the one giving, and she continued to give, and gives in her work. I'm sorry I don't have a poem to read about that or about from her, but I thank you all for being here and for thanking her. Be well. Thank, Thank you so you, much, Robert. Robert. Thank you, Robert. Um, love that line, there's a train that runs to the end of the world. And also that anecdote about Jack coming uh, two and a half inches from your ear and to share a poem there. Uh, truly so beautiful. And thank you for those remarks. Uh, 
So excited now to introduce uh, one of the most urgent and critical art writers working today, David Levi Strauss. His work focuses on the intersection between image and text and to the third space that is created through that interaction. His latest work is Coillusion, Dispatches from the End of Communication, which came out just yesteryear with MIT Press. And most recently, he was at the helm of a beautiful celebration, eulogy, tribute, uh, rendezvous for the art writing program at the School of the Visual Arts um, right here in the new social environment Zoom. So give it up for David Levi Strauss. Thank you, and thank you, Robert, for that uh, pure intensity and generosity is right. And um, they did bring it to Kansas. I, I remember Diane. I remember that I came to San Francisco in 1978 and hooked up with my best friend, Shepard Powell, who was living in the Castro. Diane had just returned to San Francisco from Marshall and Marin County with her four kids. Allen Ginsberg had introduced Shepard to Diane. When Shepard told me that he had fallen in love with Diane, I told him I didn't think it would work out because of the age difference. We were in our 20s and Diane was 44. I was 25 at the time and considered myself very wise in the ways of love. I wasn't. Diane and Shepard were together for the next 42 years, falling in love over and over again. I became part of the DePrima inner circle. Diane built a community person by person, day by day. She took friendship very seriously. She was also a great teacher, formally and mostly informally. She attracted and was attracted to renegades and radicals. And part of what she taught us was how to survive and even thrive on the edges at the margins. She did it all with love, but was tough. She expected people to be as committed as she was, and if they weren't, look out. She was like a spiritual drill sergeant, and she was like the Marines, no worse enemy, no better friend. I don't remember Diane and I having a lasting argument or fight about anything ever. I knew that she would back me up in any situation, no matter how dire and she knew I'd do the same for her. And that bound us in some weird Sicilian Kansan pact. It's how we initially understood each other and that never waned. I remember harbor, harboring various fugitives from the Brotherhood of Eternal Love, the hippie mafia, in our apartment on 16th Street, some political, some drug related, and some a mixture of the two. I remember one time driving around San Francisco in my big white Buick Saber, the knife, trying to stay away from a Sicilian smuggler with a sawed off shotgun that was out looking for us. I remember Diane coming into Gret's hospital room after the Sufi junkie smashed his car into a tree and shattered Gret's ankle, and Diane putting gemstones and sigils all over her. She then set Gret up with all the best healers in the Bay Area including Dr. Boney, the homeopath, Ian Grand, the body worker, Greg Shelkin, the hands-on healer, Helen Palmer, the psychic, and Charles Ponce, the Jungian dream analyst, in addition to Shepard. I remember that she helped Greg and me to find ourselves and let, and let, let us think we'd done it ourselves. I remember going to a Bob Dylan concert and being charged to take care of Diane's son, Rudy, who was probably eight or nine years old at the time. Rudy ate something at the concert that didn't agree with him and got sick. I had licked Diane's famous orange brick of Owsley acid earlier that day, and so was peaking when Rudy began to get sick. Nevertheless, I did take care of him and kept him safe somehow. And I always thought this was excellent preparation for taking care of my own child later. If you can do it when you're hallucinating, you can do it any time. I remember that Diane introduced me to Michael McClure because he and I were both from Kansas and we immediately hit it off. And Michael taught me the names of all the wildflowers on Mount Tamalpais. Diane first came to San Francisco in 1961 to visit Michael. I remember that Diane introduced me to Philip Whalen who encouraged me to print my first book of poetry, 
which Diane published under her Eidolon Editions imprint. I remember when Diane's daughter, Dominique, we called her Minnie then, first performed on stage at Mabue Gardens, and I knew she was going to be a star. And I remember Minnie giving me the manuscript of a play she'd written to give to her father, Mary Baraka, in Alphabet City. I remember the long drives with me driving Diane's rattletrap little red death car from San Francisco in the north to Desert Hot Springs in the south. During one specific period of time, talking with Diane for hours and getting closer than we'd ever been. I remember one Christmas morning at Diane's place on Page Street across from the Zen Center when Robert Duncan came for a visit. We all sat down at the kitchen table and Duncan and Diane began to talk. As they talked, Duncan started taking and eating bits from a chunk of hash that was lying in the center of the table. In a couple of hours, he'd eaten much of the chunk of hash, but he never stopped talking. That Christmas morning was the first time I'd heard of Duncan and Diane's plans to start a school for poets, to teach the children of the poor, they said. The poetics program was built on the affinity of the poets who came together to teach there, and Diane was a big part of that. She taught, she taught something called hidden religions about the histories of spiritual and political heresies and hermetic traditions in poetry. I remember that Diane refused to teach her class in the poetics program in the old mortuary building where the new college was housed on Valencia Street because she said it had an unhealthy miasma lying over it. So we met at her place on Page Street. And soon after that, a number of faculty members and students in the program all came down with various mysterious ailments. I remember that Diane was always able to write very directly about complex things and say and write true things without pretense or can't, yeah. both in poetry and prose. And that's what drew me to her writing and still does. I remember that Diane bridged many different parts of the radical American poetry tradition. She was really the connection among all these different strands of the romantic tradition of the lyric and Vatic strains. From Shelley, Keats and Blake to Pound, Olson, H.D., Duncan, Creeley, Frank O'Hara, Mary Baraka, Audrey Lord, David Henderson, John Wieners, Phil Whalen, David Meltzer, Duncan McNaughton, Garrett Lansing, Robert Kelly, Ginsburg, Waldman, Corso, McClure. And then as fate would have it, she ended up in San Francisco during the poetry wars and the anti-romantic backlash. She never played footsie with the counter-revolutionary forces because she knew what the stakes were. She was a fierce champion of the imagination, which she considered to be under a constant attack in our time. She said, the war that matters is the war against the imagination. All other wars are subsumed in it. Thank you. Wonderful. Wow, Levi, thank you so much. Uh, I loved that those lines, spiritual drill sergeant and harboring various fugitives from the hippie mafia, uh, which is perhaps how we might conceptualize this program uh, today. Uh, so thank you so much, Levi. And next up to the Zoom stage, I'm so excited to call poet and writer, tuning in live from Oakland, Sarah Larson. Her latest book, The Riot Girl Thing, is a polyvocal exploration of punk and poetics. Uh, she's authored two other books and is the author and mother of so many chat books. Uh, give it up for Sarah Larson. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, so happy to be here um, to celebrate Diane's life. And um, I want to read one of her poems, but I thought I'd just speak off the cuff. I didn't prepare any remarks specifically that were remembrances, but um, I do want to say that I met Diane in 2003 after I moved to San Francisco from um, from Boulder, I was going to Naropa. Um, Stephen Taylor said, would you be willing to go over and help Diane DePrima with a few things? And I was like, 
absolutely yes and then um we met each other and really hit it off um so much so that i went over to diana and shep's house every weekend probably for the next 17 years up until her death um and i was her assistant i was her student i was her friend i have so many memories of diane i can't even tell you um Gosh, I'm trying to think of, of one that, that I could get across right now. Um, actually, I remember eating together often that she would always be offering me food. I remember in the early days going to different places together, the art museum, driving around San Francisco. I remember hearing stories, um, Diane telling me she didn't even learn to drive until she was in her 40s. Um, what else? During Occupy Oakland, when I would go over to Diane and Shep's, I'd never walked away empty handed, always walking away with clothes, with food, with stuff to bring to the camp, with materials to help people um, down at Occupy. And I feel like being able to spend so much time with Diane in my life has been an immense gift and a total privilege and priceless, a priceless education oh. in poetry. Wow. So with all of that said, I'm going to read Diane's poem, Haiti, Chile, Tibet. It'll be in the new revolutionary letters coming out from City Lights in October. Let's stop for a moment to remember what we are. A handful of tribes on a rather small rock where water streams over arable earth into larger living waters we call ocean. And all is not well with our rock. It might even come apart. Could be it will soon be another asteroid belt or meteors, just a bunch of meteors. While our rock is shaking and water pours from the skies and the winds have turned demonic, could be it's time, maybe it's really time to rewrite the social contract or at least change the rules that apply in catastrophe. Just a few suggestions. Number one, all hands on deck means just that it's a really small planet. Two, anyone bringing help anywhere it's needed, bringing food, blankets, water, medicine is welcome, obviously. Don't ask where they're from, just say thank you. And we'd better learn to say thank you in hundreds of languages. Three, all borders disappear in catastrophe. They are stupid and irrelevant anyway. Four, there is no such thing as looting in a disaster. Think about it. After Katrina, Rita, all the storms, hurricanes, after the quakes in Chile, Haiti, Kobe, Managua, look back a bit. Can you call it looting when anyone breaks plate glass, comes out with food and water, medicine, camping supplies, whatever? Is that looting or just plain sanity? Keeping your family, keeping each other alive. Five, there is no place for police or army in tragedy, except as facilitators, distributors. Unarmed, they should walk the streets, bringing food, putting out fires, digging people out, rescuing those stranded on rooftops or bridges, or fleeing the waters. They should be digging latrines, putting up shelters, helping families find each other. Six, every building still intact should open its doors to everyone. What else are guest rooms for? Whoever comes to your door should be taken in. I learned when I was four, she's your guest, should be given the best of what you've got, even if you thought she had been your enemy. Not special, it's universal law and why we're still around. Seven, give up confusing your property with your life. Give up confusing your property with your life. This will save a lot of problems. Stuff comes and goes and holding on is like holding back a river with your hands. Eight, stop asking what others believe. Just look in their eyes and see we are the same. They are the same as your most beloved, be it your child, your dog, your lover. 
No child is hungry who is not your grandchild. How long will you let her wait? No child is orphaned who is not your son. And what will it take to make us remember our own? Thank you. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Thank you. So fantastic, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, so excited now to welcome poet and essayist, uh, Aaron Shurin. <clears throat> Sorry, so fantastic. Erin uh, Shurin is the author of 14 books of poetry and prose, most recently The Blue Absolute, which came out with Night Boat just last year. Please check it out. Uh, other works include Flowers in the Sky, Two Talks, The Skin of Meaning, Collected Literary Essays and Talks, and two books from City Lights, which we should check out together, all of us, Citizen and King of Shadows. Uh, a pioneer of LGBTQ studies and innovative verse, Shurin was a member of the original Good Gay Poets Collective in Boston, uh, a graduate of the Storied Poetics Program in New College, California, and he's currently the, the he's currently, he was, the, he is the former director and currently Professor Emeritus for the MFA Program at the University of San Francisco. Everyone give it up for Aaron Shurin. Thank you. <coughs> and, uh... Hello, Diane. I couldn't find the little poem uh, that I wanted to start with. I think it's from Freddie Poems and I couldn't find, find it, but it's a very, very short poem whose last line is, just I spit out of your lover's mouth. I met Diane in, when I was 29 years old, after she started dating my ex-boyfriend, Jackson. I just, and who else could you say that about? I had just published my first book, The Night Sun, and on one of my first visits to her in that beautiful floating house in Tamales Bay, Diane walked with me to the jetty, sat down, and let me read to her the long and desperately overreaching title poem of the book. She listened dutifully, and in the end made some agreeable comments. I've thought ever since that she was being kind to my very juvenile writing. And she was. But just the other day, I realized that my poem, though young and tentative, this was 1976, nevertheless included an appeal for gender redress, witchy moon gatherings, apocalyptic warnings, invocations to the mother goddess, and something very close to, oh, lost moon sisters. I believe now that I understood right away that I was a lost moon brother. Do, do I need to do something? No, okay. Later that year, Diane took Jackson and me to the much loved and lamented Surf Theater out by the Great Highway and Ocean Beach. She wanted to initiate us into the poetic mystery that is Jean Cocteau's Orphée. And she did. All of us were stupefied by Cocteau's magic. After the movie, Diane suggested we cross the road and sit in the sand by the ocean to continue airing our thoughts about our fate. So we marched across the great highway, settled in the dunes, built a campfire, and talked for an hour and a half about the movie, Poetic Risk, and the Café des Poètes. Then we got up exhausted but recharged, recrossed the road, and returned to the surf theater to watch our fate in its entirety again. Jackson and I both were ecstatic and transported. We understood we'd been given a giant gift of transmission, a passing of the lore, an extraordinary event by an extraordinary person. And from that moment on, Diane became for me a great friend and mentor, and Cocteau's Orpheus, a lifelong touchstone of true poetic imagination. Jackson died of AIDS in 1987 just as I'd begun my collection of essays, Unbound, The Book of AIDS. There you will find a piece entitled, Orfe, The Kiss of Death. It narrates my sudden shock after numerous viewings at the romantic kiss between Orfe and death, his death, a swanky lady in a black dress. I was shocked how changed my reaction to the phrase, the kiss of death had become, how altered, of the epidemic of AIDS I was living through. For now, I wrote, overlaid upon Cocteau's poetic myth, 
is a real kiss, newly fabled. My old friend Marshall is nursing his dying lover, Ken. The frame cannot be bleached of Ken's willful blue sores, skeleton haunted body, feverish lips. Hollywood lighting will not erase the shadow in his cheeks, ashen tinge of skin. In a pale room on the San Francisco Hill, the morning before Ken dies, his lover's oath continues, I love you, baby. To his mother, this is my farewell kiss to you. To Marshall eagerly, kiss me, baby. Ken doesn't have the advantage of a cinched black dress and pearls. He's wearing padded hospital diapers, pulling them down because he feels they're not sexy. He says to Marshall, suck my lizard tongue. Marshall does. I'm shaking in the juncture of Cocteau's spirit zone and my friend's house. Do actual death and disease derange the vital romance of this lived scene? Do they disgust and terrorize, black out the spotlight, stop the radio? I've seen in the announcement of this true kiss, a hail of blisters, spiral rashes, white spots on the tongue, sunken cough racked chests. These are the images that would stop the kisses, silence the poem. They don't stop Marshall, who's met his fate in Ken's love, not in his death, whose oath takes him within the failing heart of his beloved and beats there. Marshall, who delivers a fearless kiss in the transfixed zone where death's permanence lets love keep living. Before encountering his death, Orpheus is dead tired. His form has gone flat. Celebrity has leached from his work, the edge of daring. He pleases. Orpheus, your most serious defect is knowing just how far one can go, but no farther. In the words transmitted from the zone by dead sages and the princess was death. Discreet surreal phrases and the formal purity of numbers. Orpheus rediscovers his passionate disequilibrium. He pushes through to a place he doesn't understand, but believes in down through the layers and accretions of mud, language, faces in the mirror, beloved's glances, worn rhythms to an intuited measure found in a black and pure embrace. The poet meeting his fate in poetry, the lover in loving, propriety serves neither, both must go, both must go too far. In that vein is death, I recognize the grip of devotion the intent out of bounds, the pure work. Robert Duncan, our uses are our illumination. Throughout the zone, memories of men in the ruins of their habits and haunting the house, mere information restrains hand and heart, the giving and the art. Many are abandoned by those unwilling, unwilling to go far enough. Yeah. Will it be easier if I say goodbye? Asks Marshall standing there. Yes, answers Ken, say goodbye. And here the kiss of death is love's wound healed by love's avowal. Thank you. Ready? Here I Thank you. Love the comment from G.E. Schwartz, that fearless kiss, this transmission of Ophi, all faith and reason slayed. Uh, truly, truly so beautiful. Um, and thank you so much, Erin. Next up, we welcome writer and poet Cedar Saigo. Cedar Saigo was raised on the Suquamish Reservation in the Pacific Northwest, uh, God's own country. He studied at the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics at Naropa uh, Institute and is the author of, author of Royals, uh, which came out with Wave Books in 2017, Language Arts, which came out with Wave Books in 2014. Okay, perfect and Stranger in Town, which came out with City Lights uh, in 2010. Of his work, Ron Silliman writes, Cedar Saigo is a Frank O'Hara for the 21st century, witty, erudite, serious, with a terrific ear and eye for the minutest details at home in the world. Give it up for Cedar Saigo. Uh, thank you so much. Um... It's so great to be part of this uh, stellar assembly for Diane. And I just want to say um, hello to Shep. Um, and yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, my time at the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics. Um, 
specifically 1997, um, Allen Ginsberg had died and Diane was called upon to teach his MFA courses that summer. And because of that, I got to hear this incredible talk by Diane um, entitled By Any Means Necessary, um, which is actually published in this amazing anthology, Beats at Naropa. Um, so it was interesting to actually have been there and have it be this incredible transformative experience and then read it in transcription years later. Um, so let's see here. I'm going to read a little bit from this, just a paragraph and then some poems um, from Diane. Um, she says, you know, I'm not trying to say that this is so great what I did, but that you have to think of what the means are that are at your disposal and just use them. At one point when we were living probably way too expensively, I had a very interesting husband at that point who liked to spend lots of money. We did a series of limited editions. I dreamed up doing a series of limiteds that were simply very skinny little holographs. One of the poets I knew would come by and handwrite his poem or bunch of poems for me, about 12 pages on regular eight and a half by 11 unlined sheets. We'd reduce it, handwritten, print 100 copies signed by the poet, plus 25 special ones that were colored or had little doodles drawn in by the author or were special in some way and 25 more for the poet to do with as she pleased. The writer got some money, we got a bunch of money, and the Phoenix Bookshop, the same bookstore I'd worked for years earlier, but now it was owned by Bob Wilson, the bookstore dealt them for us, so they made a bunch of money too. Bob had collectors already waiting for most of the copies. So it was like printing dollar bills, you know? And you didn't even have to deal with typesetting. You just took those handwritten sheets and made a book. We did about a dozen of those little books, one a month. I was living in the Hotel Albert with four kids and this expensive husband, and there wasn't really room or time to typeset or do anything. This was a way of keeping the whole thing going. Poets Press did some regular books at the same time, but these limited editions kept that, the press and the whole scene running, including a few people who are living at the hotel separately from us and assisting with the whole operation. Um, yeah, and I just think hearing that talk from her, I just internalized instantly the fact that, you know, self-published books are real books. And often those are the books with the most interesting origin stories. Um, so I just wanted to also read a few uh, favorite poems of Diane's um, from Selected Poems 1956 to 1975, which I think Micah Ballard told me that Aaron Shuren actually helped the typesetting um, with this book. So thank you, Aaron. Um, this is a poem. I'm going to read a couple of fragments from um, longer poems. This one is the third part of a fragment called Ode to Keats. Um, this is part three, Note to Roy, uh, Leroy Jones and Mary Baraka. I wonder how often I wonder often what it is that you are doing, how much of it is pride or ambition, as we so easily say. I remember the message I gave Freddie for you, that I would see you again at the end of this, meaning my marriage and yours, not dreaming how far that would take us. Freddie dead, you living in Harlem, will you surely be killed, gunned down, like Malcolm X in some hotel or haberdasher shop some bleak room or street without my having told you you were my love among the adventures and common sense of my life. And this is the third part of another longer poem called New Mexico Poem. And this part is called The Journey. The city I want to visit is made of porcelain. The dead are gathered there. They are at their best. Bob Thompson in his checkered jacket and little hat, his grin full of cocaine spinning down the street. Frank drunk spinning out tales of Roussel, of Mayakovsky, brief anecdotes over bacon and eggs on a roll, his keenness against the wind. Fred in pointed shoes drinking an egg cream, his leotard over his shoulder in a little bag, waving amphetamine hands at the sky. 
The porcelain city glitters. I feel my friends hastening to join it and to join me there. Bob Creeley tearing through Buffalo Street, seeking entry. John Wiener is holding still, mumbling and waiting, tears under his eyelids. I walk in that brittle city, still sleepy and arrogant and desperately in love. You know why I want to read all these love poems um, to a Mary Baraka. Um, to the specter of the lecturer long dead. Why should all come clear to me now, betrayal? I sit here, elbows leaning on thighs, legs spread, stomach hangs through them, full, slightly painful. I look at the flesh my hands are, thinking you probably haven't aged at all. I would be ashamed to face you, lines around my eyes, low breasts, and just now, big belly for the fifth time. I go over it in this SF room, big fog coming in, gray sky, gray street, shouts of black kids playing late, now eight years after, and for the first time it comes as pain, comes clear what I walked out on, to turn one's back on love and walk away, like Casablanca. I hear the roar of your pain, my pain that I never touched or acknowledged, my hands pressed over eyelids, hair short too, not at all what you remember. And one more from um, Diane's days um, doing poets in the schools all over the country. Often on reservations, on uh, Indian reservations. And she's one of the few cases as an Indian writer or as a native writer where I read her writing about natives or about the reservation and I feel seen, you know, it's the first time really a non-native author writing it and I don't feel offended, I feel seen. Um, Wyoming Girls School. Motel hallway, slick new rooms, house mother at front desk could be here merely to check you in. Dismal institutional dining, yellow oilcloth on round tables, plastic chairs, hard rolls made soggy with stale chili, canned asparagus, Kool-Aid. After, we sang happy birthday to a girl who didn't smile. We ate cake with blue icing. Later, the birthday girl came to see me in my room. She said she was one of 14 children. She said her mother was dead. Her father wasn't home. She and her sister had run away from the Casper Children's Home. That's why they were here. One of her brothers was doing 60 years at Rollins Pen. He killed a man in a fight. Two other girls come in, invite me to Canteen, a hard cement floor basement, jukebox you put real money in. Where do they get it? The state gives us $2 every two weeks for soap and postage stamps. I reach for my change purse. The box is blaring three dog night, joy to the world. The girls are dancing the chicken. I try it, give up. We talk about California. One has a guy back there. It is eight, the jukebox is unplugged, the lights go out. We return under full moon to cold motel dorm, first night of Scorpio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cedar. Um, and finally, uh, last but not least, uh, to close this out in style and in rigor, we have the wonderful Anne Waldman. Uh, she's the author of more than 40 collections of poetry and poetics. Anne is an active member of the Outrider Experimental Poetry Movement and has been uh, connected with the beat movement and the second generation of the New York school uh, for you know, her, all her life. Her publications are numerous and diverse, but they include Fast Speaking Women, Marriage, A Sentence, and the multi-volume Lovis Project, as well as Voices Daughter of a Heart Yet to be Born. Give it up for Anne Waldman. Uh, Anne, take it away. Thank you so much. This has been extraordinary. These memoirs are so moving and powerful and important. I hope they, uh, come together, just catching up with everyone too is fantastic. So thank you for that. And I appreciated Robert's speaking of Diane, the two Dianes as being so important in the, you know, coming into the crowd of, I don't know what, the 
arguments, the, the dominant guys uh, that I certainly encountered and how important that was. So just a few little bits here. I was gonna read from the, by any means necessary, but Cedar uh, took that away. And that's a wonderful talk that's in our, you know, one of the Naropa anthologies. Um, and there are other things that we posted of Diane at Naropa. I hope people will check them out. Uh, so early hit transmission. I visited Diane de Prima at the Albert Hotel in the early 60s. Uh, Alan Marlowe had taken me to see her. I was still in my teens and I felt some affinity there and incredible um, you know, generosity as people have indicated just what she, you know, take them to do after the seeing the Cocteau movie or whatever it was, just constantly uh, expanding the world. So I visited her at the Albert and felt some affinity with her Buddhist and alchemical studies. These were interests of mine, her incredible vivid shrine, her investigations into the nature of consciousness through poetry, collage making, theater, community. And she had some Buddhist iconography and a lot of other things going on uh, in her amazing collages. Uh, she was constantly in, in practice with something. And there were people living there. Jeannie, uh, her first child was born, young baby at the time. And I started to understand that these, I starting to understand that these images were to be visualized in practice. They were devices in a, a kind of, um, you know, radical way of, of seeing the world. You, are, you identified with them. They became these kind of, Yidams for your own uh, consciousness. And you became the energy and aspiration of the deity. So you had these red skinned women with skull cups of blood stomping on the corpses of ego. And what seemed like these, you know, warrior implements, all these accoutrements in these uh, held in the many arms of the, uh, these various female deities. And I remember Gary Snyder saying years ago that you know, women might be more drawn to the uh, expressions of this kind of the, the vivid iconography of the Tibetan Buddhist uh, realm. And, but Diane had been a student, an important student of uh, Zen, um, of course. And but that business of sitting in front of a, you know, a white bare wall and having to confront your own mind, it was helpful to have these red skinned uh, yoginis, dakinis with animal heads and so on. So, and the, the idea that these were given in special, but we, you know, finding, finding our way, one didn't have necessarily have, you know, these uh, definitive sort of teachers. I really appreciated that, you know, the, the idea of finding out for yourself um, and the wrathful aspects of uh, everything. And then just always thinking of how continually, I mean, we're still here. I feel haunted by Diane. It's so exciting that all this work is starting to be done uh, into her, you know, vast body of work, not her, her prose, as well as her poetry, her, her actions in the world, her friendships, this incredible spiritual ethos. And there's this, you know, glorious haunting going on. And so welcoming Diane always. Um, so just thinking of how she prioritized and Levi had the, you know, the famous quote of the only war that matters is the war against the imagination. But that was so uh, primal with her always prioritizing imagination, the, you know, heightened sense perceptions, but also with this in, uh, wonderful grounded, you know, sensibility and, and reality, but the practices of imagination. Uh, the Sufis have this term, Alam al mithal, 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 the world of pure image, which can arrive in dreams and also be evoked through various mystical techniques. And I always, uh, Diane was a great thinker and scribe of such things, of these techniques. And I think of her, you know, in this sort of, um, her, her attention to the details, you know, the dharmic luminosity of our very existence was so important in that line, the child, the dog, the lover, you know, also very, very grounded in coming from this, you know, Italian anarchist uh, background in Brooklyn. But thinking back to her, you know, the, what her early teaching at Naropa, her copious notebooks and her own collage work where everything, you know, everything was altered with her particular uh, magic. And that quest in her, this sort of, uh, which I felt, you know, in myself as a younger 
person, this transcendent ec ecstasis, you know, hunting, adventuring for that ecstasis. So, you know, always thinking of her as this phenomenal investigator of other, of soul making and carrying this, this dimension of uh, our existence, which can just e expand. And you find it so rarely. Um, so finding that, you know, in her, in her, in her primordial gate of mind, her, her just her actions in the world. And then also the sense of, you know, truth, which we're arguing all the time. It's not, you know, it's not limited so that it can be logically or practically demonstrated. There's always this interior dimension to that, always this, uh, work with her normal waking consciousness and then coming to her own um, authority, which is, is so admirable. So, um, yeah, this was something I wrote right when she died, revolutionary letter, this is 2021, to preserve the element of unknown places, Aldo Leopold one, Dear regenerative agriculture, come our way. All the extra carbon could be taken care of in a degrowth utopia. Concern that we are just procedural? Know your soul. Just so you know, Diane de Primo had full body spirit of outrage. She was transmitting groundedness, although she studied angelicity and systems of dialectic art. She was a shield. She was a sanctuary. She knew the skandhas, never a hall of mirrors. She opened the field, opened the field, continually opened the field, justice for all, an ecology of practice and mind. No sunset, no sunrise, crimson hues of dawn, moonset, moonrise, no moonset, no moonrise. How you waited, know their tongues, why they speak to you, what they said to you, what the thunder said. Do you want blood to come out of me? Chaos of storm, of fire, learn lessons of sorrow, tithe time, come with your punctuation, your dharma vow, be ready to evacuate, enough for, have enough for 10 days survival, keep simple, have a place to stay, read the invisible committee, Ashil Menembe, the Zapatista reader, full body burden, the Akashic records, sunken suns, who stands in the sun, who is meant for these firestorms? It's a line from Loba, who stands in the sun? Who is meant for these firestorms? Ask this every day, create a shrine of intention as Diane did every day. And a few things of hers, I've always loved this poem for Audrey Lord, narrow path into the back country. One, you are flying to Dahomey, going back to some dream or never, never land, more forbidding and perfect than Oz. Will land in Western airport, noisy, small and tacky, will look around for ocean as she stands waiting for baggage. Well, we carry pure land paradise within. You carry it to Dahomey from Staten Island. Two, we endure. This we are certain of. No more, we endure famine, depression, earthquake, pestilence, war, flood, police state, inflation, earthsats food, burning cities. You endure, I endure. It is written on the face of our children. Pliant, persistent joy will like mountains, hope that batters your heart and mind, hear them shout. And I will not bow out, cannot see your war as different. Turf stolen from yours and mine, clandestine magics we practice, all of us for their protection, that they have fruit to eat and rice and fish till they grow strong. Remember the octopus we did not cook, Sicilian style, West African style, it fills your daughter's dream. I refuse to leave you to your battles, mean to mine. My girl chased white coyote, sister to my wolf, and not through maces. Three, how to get the food on the table, how to heal, what survives this whirlwind, people and land. The sea tosses feverish, screams in delirium to have the right herb drying in the kitchen. Your world and mine, all others, not the third. This is fourth world going down, the Hopi say, yet we endure. Four, and more, we fly to light, fly into pure land paradise, New York, Dahomey, Mars, Jakarta, Wales, the willful, stubborn children carrying seed, all races hurtling time and space and stars to find container large and find enough 
fine wrought enough for our joy, for all our joy. And then just a bit of the, um, for HD, another beautiful yes. poem on this lineage of, of the, uh, the feminine. Uh, Heart's truth spat out of sleep was only hate. I caught it on my pillows, tried to turn it to diamonds, sometimes succeeded so far as quartz in the hand. Like ice, it melted. Heat of my will burns down the walls around me time after time, yet there remain incrustations of old loves, filthy barnacles sucking my marrow, my illness that I am not blind yet cannot transmute in body cauldron I carried hate or indifference, anger, clothed it in child flesh and in the light. It seemed I had worked magic, but the stone sticks in their throats, night screams and morning tears, phantoms of fathers, dead skin hung on old bones like jewels in the hair. Three, I am a woman of pleasure and give back salt for salt, untrammeled by hope or knowledge. I have left these in the grindstones of other thresholds, now only bedrock, basalt to crack your breath. Beloved, yeah. to suck for drink. I am not fair, but you are more than fair. You are too kind. Still water in which, like a crystal, the phantoms dance, each carrying death like a spear. For we die of each other's hate or indifference. Draw blood to draw our poison. But it has seat in heart of our heart, the hallow of the marrow of our bones, salt for salt, and the desert is infinite. It drinks more juice than we carry. I'm just going to uh, read a little recent poem. It's dedicated to my recent grandchild, Cora Bayanaya, and it's uh, inspired by this poem Diane wrote for Tara, right. uh, where she is. This is just part of that. This morning we walked to breakfast. Birds were singing, holy, 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 holy wheat. Well, anyway, whole wheat is holy too. And this is Cora Dreams Her Crown, Crown, and it has a line from Maria Sabina, because everything has its origin, and I'm going place to place from the origin. So I'll read it in memory of Diane. Tenter hooks in an experiment, classroom gone empty in fateful pandemic. I write truce with new second alphabet, forgetting first truth unseated territory of Ute, Cheyenne, Arapaho. How far we go a century, who reads future weather? Keep writing from stage left, do lessons for treatise on sleep, invite numbers and chants up as seer of calculus, as topology, abuelita, perhaps a wrong occasion, but spiraling. They'll be back, please come back, the storm knocked power out. We bed down instead in another room in Mexico, the states of the Nahuatl, Stylus and astrolobe with soft animals, lunar moth, mastodon, cora, bebe, and charge in velvet chaplet, sitting on haunches, equinoctial. She's always rising up, rising up her wand, her crown, her formidable beauty. Animals frightened in the rain and texts wet. What is erased is problematic. You want to cry, but hold invisible scripture, spiral memory, telepathy. I have memory, she says, holy, 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 holy. Girl Cora studies, older now, writes between rounds of crystal ammunition, her dream. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anne. Um... I, I need to echo what Michelle Laporte uh, shared in the chat. Thank you so much, Anne, for this deep magical history uh, and for giving us so much. Um, of course, everyone, thank you for your thoughts and remarks. Uh, Cedar, thank you for sharing that experience, being seen by the non-native writer, which I know will resonate uh, with so many. Uh, and thank you all so much for sharing your uh, phenomenal uh, readings and thoughts. And now I'd love to pass the mic back to our wonderful host, Nearly Tchaikovsky. Uh, and share a little uh, photograph that uh, that he shared with us. Okay. Which is right here. Yes, that's it. That's at Diane's 80th birthday party at the Emerald Tablet in North Beach. And uh, her children were there, uh, uh, Dominic, Rudy, the, the whole gang and, and the North Beach contingent, the whole, uh, Jack, read a poem for her and and uh, thank you so much uh, Amiel for that 
reading Diane's poem for Jack, she really got Jack Hirschman down. Um, and thank you again to the Brooklyn Rail um, for honoring um, all these poets for doing your radical poetry reading series for the great uh, work that uh, Anselm Berrigan is doing with poetry every issue. Uh, it's a great and wonderful thing. So thank you again. And thank you, Diane De Prima, And thank you, Jack Hirschman. I'll close with just three lines by Jack Hirschman. I am not a mach I am not a slave. You are not a machine. And this is not an opium dream, comrade. Thank you. This is not an opium dream, comrade. It's so perfect. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all, Emil, Robert, Sarah, Cedar, Levi, and Waldman, uh, Neely, for bringing us all together uh, into this beautiful space, for opening it up, for bringing Jack Hirschman into the embrace as well, to Anselm Berrigan, who is so vital to pulling together this beautiful event. Um, and as always, we'll share the recording of today's reading on our archives, as well as on YouTube, so it will be available in a day or two, if ever you'd like to revisit this magical space. Um, and please join us again tomorrow, if you have a moment, when we'll take a field trip via Zoom to AIR Gallery, the first all-female artists cooperatively run gallery in the nation right here in New York City. We'll be joined by a variety of members of the broader community, directors, members, staff, Susan B, Christian Camacho Light, Roxana Fabius, Kat Griffin, Maxine Henriesen, Joanne McFarland, and Joan Snitzer. And they'll be in conversation with our very own rail editor at large, Jessica Holmes. We'll be closed out with a poetry reading by Joanne McFarland, and that will be as always at 1 p.m. right here in the Zoom. Other than that, thank you all so much. I'll invite you to turn on your microphones if you'd like to say hello to one another, goodbye on your way out, or anything else uh, that compels you. But this has been truly so beautiful. Thank you for being a gathering of tribes on the rock together. Um, thank you, Neely, especially. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. all. Thank you. Hi, Aaron. Incredible. Incredible. Thank you, David. Robert. Thank you. Thank you. So thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Malvika.